Um, we've had a very exciting day, as I briefed the minister a while ago. Um, at IPS, we do things the other way around. Most conferences begin with the guest of honor opening the conference. We always insist on the guest of honor closing a conference. Um, and we have, um, for the past uh, three uh, first Singapore perspectives, two years ago, we had Deputy Prime Minister Tamil Shanmugaratnam here. Last year, we had the Prime Minister um, closing the, di uh, the, the Singapore perspectives. And he came um, two days after the Pongol East by election. Um, <laughs> this time around, I, um, I didn't arrange this, um, but we're having this conference on difference one week after the Anton Casey case broke. <laughs> and, uh, and the Prime Minister had a meeting with the uh, Malay Muslim leaders on Saturday. Uh, so it is appropriate um, somehow, um, fortuitously, to have this um, session. Minister Heng does need no introduction. He has had a very illustrious career in the public service. He has served as permanent secretary in the Ministry of Trade Industry. He was our chief banker, uh, 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 the, the head of the central bank, the equivalent of central bank, the uh, monetary authority of Singapore. And he was in an earlier um, um, stage of his career, um, principal private secretary to the former prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, who has publicly said that Mr. Heng is the best PPS he has had. So he must be very impressive indeed. For <laughs> to, have, to have survived, um, not only survived, <laughs> survived Mr. Mr. Lee, but to have been publicly praised uh, by uh, the former Prime Minister. Um, he has also been uh, the maestro of big events in the Singapore government, first um, um, in, in overseeing the Our Singapore conversation, with, on which I, I worked closely with and observed with him observe how he worked, um, and it was very inspiring to, to, to work with him on that project. Now he's chairing the, the Singapore 50 uh, Celebrations Committee. Um, we just launched the logo a couple of days ago, or last week, rather, Friday, and, um, and he will be taking us through this over the next two years. So without much ado, I will invite Minister Heng to make some brief remarks, yeah. after which we will have an open dialogue um, for about an hour or so. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Janaras, and uh, thank you for your very kind introduction. And I'm very happy to see so many uh, friends and leaders in the various sectors here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think Mr. Lee makes uh, great decisions and great judgments on many things, but sometimes he gets certain things wrong. <laughs> 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 now, um, I, I, I understand that you had a really lively session this, uh, today. Uh, on this topic of uh, differences. So I thought I'll start with some remarks about uh, differences. Uh, let me uh, start with sharing a story of what one professor, Professor El Monayim, uh, who led a course many, many years ago when I was a very uh, junior officer on organizational development. And it was quite a long course. And at the end of it, he said, I think most of you will forget almost everything that I've taught in this course. But I hope that if there's one thing that stays in your mind, uh, it is this. And so he said, individuals are, are different. Individuals are interesting, they're creative, they have views, they have perspectives. But when two individuals come together, they form a diet, D-Y-A-D. When three individuals come together, they form a triad. And the dynamics of the relationship changes. And you know, you, I hope that all of you would invest your time and energy to learn about the dynamics among individuals, the dynamics within a group, and across groups. Because you would have to learn how to deal with differences and how to bring people together. And I have to say that that, I mean, he was very, very insightful. I think that, to me, was the, the best insight I got from that very long course. And indeed, I've forgotten a lot of the details of that course, but this thought stuck with me all my working life. And, in, you know, some of us 
when, when two persons come together, the differences need to be appreciated, need, needs to be managed, needs to be harnessed. Uh, yesterday, or, or day before, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was an interesting article in the Straits Times Forum page by a Miss uh, Maria Lowe. And she said that human beings have a deep psychological need to belong to a group. We easily associate ourselves with an inside and outside group. And we love to be part of an inside group. And by the same token, we then think that anyone who is different from us is an outside group, and therefore we treat them sort of differently. And understanding this intergroup dynamics helped us understand how we can bring groups uh, together. And indeed, if you survey the terrain, not just in Singapore, but across the world, uh, differences exist within groups, across groups. Uh, whether it's families, clans, community of any description. Uh, as long as you, ch you know, the moment you tag a community as a particular racial group, religious group, a company, a football team, whatever you choose to call it, you know, particular NGO, nation states, you'll find differences. You'll find that people would, would have differences that sometimes are real, sometimes are perceived. But there will be, and I think you have to deal with those differences. But I think when we come together, rather than exist as an individual, when we come together either in a group of two or in a group of ten or in a, in a society of five million, it must be that being together allows us to accomplish more, allows us to have a better life than being alone. Uh, being in a team allows us to achieve more. Being in an organization allows us to do more. Uh, than if we are trying to do it alone. And being part of a, a global uh, movement, whether it's on, on trade or on climate change, allows us to do more uh, than we are to do it alone. But at the same time, to ignore that there are differences in these groups would mean that we will not be able to accomplish much. Diversity. So this theme of uh, and unity, I think, pervades all aspects of our life. And I think our key challenge is, is this. The key challenge is how do you maintain this yin and yang of diversity and unity. When groups are too diverse, too disparate, and where our focus is to emphasize differences, we lose that sense of togetherness, that sense of cohesion, that sense of purpose that enables us to do things together. When groups are too cohesive, too closed, too comfortable, uh, you end up losing the creative voices, and the group eventually stagnates and loses its vibrancy. And calibrating this differences is not something that you can establish once and for all and say that's it. It is an ongoing, continual process of calibrating this. And I think, I believe deeply that societies will be successful and groups will be more successful. We are continually able to manage this unity and, and, and diversity and to create the right balance and to be able to calibrate this balance as time changes, as circumstances uh, uh, change. So, let me just offer uh, three uh, complementary approaches to how we might think about this issue. I say three not because these are the only three, but because I see Professor Tommy Cole here, and I must use a magic number of three. <laughs> now, the first is to ensure that differences do not divide us. Uh, and, and in order to do that, I think it's important to appreciate the nature of the differences. Every time when two persons come together and say, I don't agree, or you know, I, I have a different point of view, or I have a different take on this, I think it's useful for us to step back and, and reflect, what is the nature of this difference? And how we, might we uh, advance our, our learning, our thinking on this issue? There are certain differences which are really based on facts and hypothesis. It is verifiable, it is falsifiable, and you know, where science has made a lot of the progress in this area is that you can go out and investigate this. There is an empirical basis for my statement. There's an empirical basis for saying whether this is right or wrong. And where it is falsifiable, I think we make progress. And that's how I think a lot of science and a lot of advances in science and technology have taken place. There are others which are a little more um, difficult to, to say, and I would put social norms, taste, preferences, and all that in that box. And if you think about social norm, I understand that, uh, you know, when my grandma used to tell me that during her time, it is 
families object strenuously within the Chinese family if you try to marry outside your dialect group. And lots of quarrels take place over there. You know. Today, I doubt there are many families who say, I object to you marrying someone from a different dialect group. But the norms have changed so much. And indeed, if you look at our marriage statistics, our interracial marriages has actually gone up. And so I, th I think it is a norm that evolved and changed over time. And our collective view of what is right or what is wrong uh, has changed significantly. And those are the things which I think, you know, the sort of values we attach to uh, identification with particular groups, particular attributes, uh, will change. Uh, our ordering of preferences of what matters most in a particular situation will change. And the, the sort of norms will evolve as time uh, changes. Now, there's a third box, which is a lot harder for us to say, you know, let us try and understand this and try and give a definitive answer. And I'll put all religious beliefs in that box. Uh, I think we, we need to have a deep humility that we do not understand this deep wisdom about religion. Uh, and very often, when we try to push very hard on religious issues, you just end up with uh, a lot of conflicts. I think if you look at the history of religious uh, conflicts over the ages, uh, it is because every, everyone, the person, the parties involved are deeply convinced that they hold a right belief and the other parties hold a wrong belief and therefore you end up with uh, very deep clashes, uh, sometimes with very tragic consequences. And I think in those areas, it is for us to step back and say, let's be humble about this and that let's be wise about this area. Now, to ensure that differences do not divide us, if we, if we try and understand how this different types of, the, this, the nature of these differences, I think we are in a better position to navigate it. And at the same time, uh, that we should try and develop a deeper sense of empathy and try to understand rather than to be understood and try not to be too judgmental. And that was what I uh, was very cheered by our Singapore conversation. We held a year-long discussion on that topic. Um, it was an experiment for many of us, you know, certainly myself, because it was such an open-ended format. But I must say that it turned out uh, better than I expected. That people came together, and the greatest value to me was not that we ended up with a certain set with a, with a report. But I think the greatest value for me was that different people came together, started off with very different perspective, and then when they sat around and talked to somebody face to face and appreciate that each of us has different needs, concerns, aspirations, to be able to appreciate it, I thought that was, that was wonderful. And I hope that this spirit of uh, respectful conversation would allow us to understand uh, differences and uh, manage this a lot better. So that's my first uh, comment. The second approach is how we can make differences a source of strength, a source of creative and productive strength. Uh, let me just share three very quick examples. Um, at uh, Duke NUS, our new medical school program, which is a postgraduate program, uh, students no longer uh, work as individuals, they work as a team. And the idea was that if you need to attend to, a pers to, a, to an individual, you should not be looking at the individual as a sum of parts, but you know, and each one of us just looking at the heart or the lungs or a particular part, but you need to look at, it, look at the person holistically. And therefore, a team of medical doctors need to be able to have the habits very early on to work together as a team. So they structure in such a way that you know, they form all these different teams. What was very surprising after a while was that many groups decided that they must have an engineer in the team. I, I see some engineers in the room here. And the reason was that they found that the engineer always brought a very practical problem-solving approach to the issue at hand. And so you have the bio, bio, biologist, you have the chemist, you have you know, all kinds of training, but the engineer brought to a certain end. And I think it's a wonderful example of how that diversity can be harnessed into a strength. Um, some of you are aware that I negotiated the trade agreement with India, and uh, I also, in my last life as MD of MAS, uh, traveled to the Middle East very often to promote Singapore as a center for Islamic finance. And what helped me greatly in both those tasks is the fact that I grew up in a multiracial, multicultural society and I'm surrounded by colleagues 
who are multiracial, multicultural, and I learned a lot from them. And when I went to the Middle East, uh, I had my team of officers from MAS who understood Middle Eastern culture and Islamic culture uh, very well, and I learned a great deal from them. When I went to India, I had many of our uh, Indian businesses and businessmen who said, look, this, uh, these are the cultural norms, these are the business norms, these are the negotiation norms, you know, please work on this carefully. And I'm glad that you know, it, it really helped. And my favorite analogy to that is that I, I wish that Singaporeans are like the adapter plug. You know, the adapter plug we carry wherever we go. Uh, because whichever country we can plug in and tap the energy of that country. And this question is how do we do that well? Yes. And my last example of that is really that uh, I was recently given a book by the Asian Civilization Museum by someone at ACM. And we can't possibly match the collection of China or India in the great arts collection that they have. But, I th but in that book, I saw some really lovely collections of arts that fuse Indian and Chinese traditions. And that's something that, again, you know, something that comes to us a lot more instinctively. And I think it's a great example of how we harness diversity and, and make it into a strength for Singapore. Now, my last ex point is that in, in managing these differences, I think it's important that uh, not all differences can be settled once and for all. And whatever it is, despite our differences, we must always seek to find common causes so that we can enlarge, enlarge our common space and build trust. And uh, again, let me give three examples of how we can enlarge our, find common causes, enlarge our space, and, and build trust. Uh, the first is, I think, rather unique in, um, among countries is that we have these interreligious organizations that come together ever so often to talk about issues of faith. Uh, I recently met a group of religious leaders from different uh, denominations. And the reason I met them was interested today. to see how they can help students from lower income group. They wanted to provide more bursaries and so on. And I was very sure that you know, they found a common cause in terms of how we can help uh, students who need extra support. And, uh, but more importantly, what I observed was that because they came together to work on a, a cause that they all felt passionately about, that process enabled them to build trust, to build understanding. And it was a lot easier, I think, if you have a difficult uh, situation involving religion, for them to be able to come together and say, let's talk about this. And I think if we have the habit of doing that, I, we will be able to do a lot more together. Uh, now, in this room, we have uh, three very eminent ambassadors, uh, Kishore, Tommy, and Heng Chi. And you know, each of them has done interesting work uh, globally. And I think the global differences uh, on many of these issues are even sharper because real interests are at stake, sovereignty is at stake, you know, wealth is at stake. But at the end of it, we have to ask ourselves, are we better off cooperating or better off accentuating the differences? And being able to find a common cause to then come out, be it the law of the sea, be it the way that we relate to the US, be it the way that we conduct affairs at the United Nations, I think all three of our ambassadors have done great work in advancing that cause. And I think this is something that's probably very instinctive to them. And, and I hope that the same instinct of what we do globally can also be applied locally. So, so rather than, than to, to just talk about what are these differences and how might we solve it, if there are certain differences that cannot be resolved today, uh, let us put it aside, let us find what are the things that we can do together and uh, make for a better society? So on that note, let me, uh, I think Janadas mentioned about Singapore 50. So uh, let me make a very small commercial pitch that uh, you know, Singapore 50 will be a great time for us to celebrate all that is good and nice about Singapore, uh, all that is funny, quirky, and odd about Singapore. And that to, for us to think about how might we build a better society together going forward. So I'll be happy to hear your views. Thank you. First, uh, a mic check. I mean, can everyone hear us? Are you having difficulty hearing? Uh, okay, we have to solve this. Um, oh, which are the groups that couldn't hear? Oh. oh. 
Okay. Can you hear uh, me now? Oh, so is it my mic or his mic? Oh, so it's my mic. Can you hear me now? No? Oh. Okay, there's an easy solution. They switch mics. <laughs> that might not so It might be my voice. <laughs> Can we, do we have a hand now, please? Is, can you hear me now? It's not very loud, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, let me summarize very quickly three major points the minister made. Uh, how to ensure differences do not divide us. How to make differences a source of strength. And finally, in managing differences, not everything can be settled once and for all. We must try constantly to enlarge our common space Things that cannot be settled immediately, perhaps we should just leave them alone for the moment and concentrate on the things on which we can agree. Uh, let me open the questions uh, to the floor. Um, we have actually quite a lot of time, a little more than an hour. Um, perhaps we'll take an hour and then I'll give you some time at the end to sum up um, and I can say uh, uh, our goodbyes. Um, <laughs> First question, I'll call upon Gillian to ask the first question. And uh, Minister? Yeah. Please forgive my director. He knows I'm the most talkative person in IPS. <laughs> but let me see if I can, hopefully this is not too tangential, but it's a natural sort of... Uh, development of what you were saying. I think a lot of Singapore is concerned that we do not cause new divisions or we do not exacerbate differences. And so in the morning we were talking about the issues of social mobility, bearing in mind that Singapore has chosen to be open, knowing that we are an open trading center, we actively court foreign investments, we're open to all the other ills of globalization, technological change, the great doubling. And so we see income divides rising, but not only that, that perhaps the age of average is over and the middle class is also under threat. So my question, Minister, is really this, what can we do to ensure that at least through the education platform, which is under you, we can uh, mitigate you know, these differences and ensure the rate of social mobility in Singapore is still healthy. I don't look at social mobility of the top 40%, <laughs> maybe not even the top 50%, but may I just ask you if you are inclined to look at more universalist, universalistic help for everybody, every child, every young child, so that they can have the best preschool education they can get as a gift from the Singapore people to each individual child? Or would you still want to persist in a more targeted approach for the kids of the families at the bottom 10 or 20 percent? What is the strategy going forward given that we see the income divides and the middle class possibly even disappearing so that we may all feel part of the bottom 10 or 20 percent? It's perception, though not necessarily reality in the stats. Thank you, Minister. Right. Thank you. Well, thanks, Julian. Uh, can you all hear me now from the side? Yeah. Okay. Now, I, th I think what you raise is uh, very important and uh, I will also say a very difficult challenge because if you look at um, the impact of globalization and the impact of technological advances, uh, the, the effects are just going to uh, accelerate. I think the, the, the effects in terms of this widening divide because skills now command a far higher premium than it was before. Uh, and it is not just technology. If you look at your best football star, you know, they earned many times, many, many times more than uh, Pele was able, ever able to command uh, at, the, at his prime. And you can put it across whether it's basketball, football, uh, CEOs of companies, technologists, and so on. And uh, the latest issue of economists is a very uh, 
interesting, uh, well, the last issue of the economics on technology and its impact on jobs, the, uh, its impact on income distribution, and so on and so forth. And in a software-enabled world, the ability to program, ability to uh, master this new technology uh, will, will command a, a big premium. And, and as long as we don't go back you know, to an age of protectionism, I think that trend will, is likely to accelerate. And I've spoken on this subject on a number of times because on the impact of technology and how you basically have a digital economy that sits beneath and on top a physical economy. And that digital economy is quietly transforming many, many jobs in many, many sectors. So I would say that it's, it, it is indeed a major challenge. Now then the question is, what can education do about it? And I'll say education can do something about it. Uh, and then I'll say what education cannot do about it. Now first, what education can do about it. You raise the issue of preschool, whether we should ensure a, a world-class, you know, first-rate preschool across our system, or whether that might be the solution. And my take is that there is no uh, magic bullet about preschool. I believe we need to do a lot more in preschool we need to invest in it. We need to think of how best uh, to help young children acquire, particularly uh, uh, acquire skills in a few areas. One is that confidence and that joy of learning uh, and that very basic instinct to, to, in languages and in numeracy. But I should also caution that preschool, a good preschool is not the silver bullet. Now, reason is this. I, about a year ago, I visited uh, Mr. Jeffrey Canada at the New York Harlem Children's Zone, cited by and Mr. President Jeffrey Obama Canada. for having transformed uh, Harlem Zone and for having given opportunities to many, many children from low-income group. And I, I had a very long chat with him to look at the history of what he did. He's such a remarkable man, you know, and I learned a lot from him. So he started, he had a, a master's degree from uh, Harvard Education School. And at that time, everybody said, oh, no, preschool is the thing. So he started, he organized preschool. Then he found that when, his, when these uh, kids went to elementary school, they started falling behind. So he said, uh, elementary school is a solution. So he then went on to do elementary school. Then he found that they, they then fought at high school. So he said, I better do high school. So he did high school. Then they went to college. And in the first years, they all dropped out from college. And they say, now I've got to do college. So he ended up doing from womb to college. <laughs> you know, because it is a support system that, that is needed. And therefore, I, I, I think that we should do a lot in preschool. But we should also think about what we can do pre-preschool. And we should also think about how we can continue to enhance the quality of education, uh, the basic 10 years of education. What is it that we should do? And there, I think I mentioned about how we can give every child a broad and deep foundation for lifelong learning. And if we can achieve that, I think we would have uh, helped quite a bit. But there's, and I think there's a lot that education can do. Uh, you can do a lot more at the institutes of higher learning, at ITE, at Poly, and at the university. But I would also be very um, uh, um, humble about the role of the education can play because, uh, again, I've looked at education systems around the world. One of the most often cited is, you know, Finland has the best education system in the world. Um, or the Nordic countries. And recently, youth unemployment rate in Finland is over 20%. Right? I do not believe that the education system in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece is in such a sorry state that you have unemployment rate of over 50%. So one has to recognize that there are broader forces at work about the economy that we need to take care of. And unless we continue to restructure the economy, unless we continue to create good jobs, a good education system by itself does not solve the problem. So I think we need to look at the supply side. We need to make sure that we equip every Singaporean to be as, as uh, capable as possible, to be able to fulfill their potential as well as much as possible. But at the end of the day, 
whether we can create the opportunities in Singapore uh, for them to thrive, for them to contribute, uh, and for them to create, continue this virtual cycle uh, requires more than uh, what education can do. It requires really a very much a collective effort. And I see many industry captains here. You know, what you do in, a, in your industry, what sort of jobs you create, how do we help Singaporeans to continually, continually upgrade on their jobs? How do we link that to con uh, our continual education system so that it is literally a lifelong journey? I think those are the critical factors. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Asad Latif from IPS. Uh, Minister, continuing on the stream that uh, Gillian you know, kind of uh, touched on, yeah. something that came up this morning was on foreigners, <laughs> in fact, even new citizens, as a source of not just difference, but divergence and, um, and, and problematic divergence in society. Uh, my question to you is this. How do you visualize this whole issue of the so-called foreigners versus us. Why this versus? And whatever your answer to that would be, if you take stock of what the government has done till now to integrate foreigners into, mm -hmm. our, into our civilization and our civilization, right. and also um, in, in terms of new citizens, uh, how, how would you rate what you've done? And what are some of the more, uh, some practical steps, some more practical steps that could be taken to make this situation better? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Asad. Um, well, you're, you have uh, several questions. I think the first is, you know, why is there this discomfort and this about having foreigners in, in Singapore, having new citizens in Singapore? And I would say that a number of factors. Uh, one is, I believe that um, assimilation of people from a different culture, a different group is, is an organic process. It takes time. And where the numbers are too large, uh, it is natural to feel a little overwhelmed. And they feel that, gee, I got surrounded you know, by, by people who seem very alien. And therefore, it's important for us to calibrate the inflow uh, carefully. And in that way, it allows for a, a pace of adjustment. So that's one. Uh, second, I think we need to do a, a better job of explaining the value you know, of staying open, the value of working with people from different countries, different cultures, and, and different groups. I recently visited the university, and I had this group of uh, students. There were five of them who started a company. And out of these five, uh, three were Singaporeans, and two were from India. So I, I asked, so they briefed me what they were doing. There was a very interesting software program um, that met a very important market need in Singapore. So I turned to the three Singaporean boy and said, uh, or there's a girl, and I said, would you have started this company, just the three of you, or with another two Singaporeans? And they said, no. I said, why not? They said, because this, my fellow student from India is a whiz kid in programming, and I wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So I turned to the, the two uh, Indian students and I said, would you have started your own company since you're a whiz kid in programming? And I said, no, because we don't understand the market. We don't have the insight about what we can do with our programming skills. And I see that story over and over again uh, in, in various meetings. And I think if we are able to uh, bring that about, you know, bring that knowledge about what the benefits are, and I think things will be a lot better. Now, there's also another aspect uh, which I've spoken before, in fact, right in this room, uh, which is to, to employer groups, which is that in some instances, uh, do we do have egregious HR practices that uh, where instead of looking at the merit of a candidate, uh, we, some companies end up doing the other extreme that because the HR person happens to be from a particular country and is more comfortable with people whom he uh, whom he or she 
already knows is that the easy way is to just get someone you know. And of course, the Singaporean in the company will feel very aggrieved that you know, they got bypassed because of that reason. And that's where I think MOM's fair consideration framework would help uh, in, in this regard. So that's one aspect of you know, how we might manage some of these uh, real differences in, in, in perception, real differences in interest. But there's also another aspect, which is uh, the absorption of any new culture and the assimilation of people into a Singaporean way of life is not an easy process. And that's where I mentioned earlier on about the importance of empathy, the importance of understanding, the importance of creating many more opportunities for interaction. And we can do it, each and every one of us can do it at different levels, whether it's in a company, whether it's at our, uh, at our community, uh, whether it's in, in the universities. I think we got to take a stand that, you know, let's, let's stay open, uh, let's make sure that, let's try and integrate people into our midst. And I think it makes for a stronger society. But at the same time, let's calibrate this you know, in a way that the organic process can be allowed to work itself. Good afternoon, Mr. Heng and Mr. Janadas. I am Benjamin, uh, an engineering student from Nian Polytechnic. Okay. I'd first like to quote certain things that um, Dr. Leslie Teo from the second panel has stated. I'm not sure where you are seated, but uh, yeah. I hope um, I had noted and interpreted them correctly. <laughs> Dr. Teo mentioned that um, Singapore is changing and advancing towards a newer and very different technological age faster than ever before and even had the probability of computerized automotives replacing jobs calculated. 40 percent, uh, 47% of the jobs can be computed. There are computer several rights. literature studies advocates here, but I am an uh, advocate for programming. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, if Singapore is really advancing towards such an incoming um, technological storm, should knowledge unconventional in basic education, uh, such as programming and web page design, be included in basic education to prepare people for such, an, such a fully computerized and automotive scenario? And perhaps um, uh, inseminate your opinions on whether a fully automotive industry or workforce would be a desirable method to alleviate dependence on manual labor. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ben. And uh, I can see that you are a strong advocate for programming. Uh, I would encourage you to really take up programming. Yeah. Now, um, as your question about should we teach uh, programming in, uh, in school, um, it is something which I'm looking at uh, quite seriously uh, for the reasons that you mentioned. Not so much that we make everyone uh, a programming geek, but rather to understand the basic logic of uh, these forces at work that will shape us and to see how we can harness the impact of this technology. And uh, we have started some experiments in our schools uh, in that area in the form of computer clubs and all that. Uh, the, the question for us is whether we should do uh, a lot more. And I've been looking at school systems which have started this and uh, the, the, the effect of this. I've spoken to some of our, uh, some of our Singaporeans who are at Silicon Valley working in various places like Google and, and starting you know, Coursera and all that and looking at what is it that we can do uh, to really prepare our people better for, for this uh, IT age. Uh, I think we are still at a very early stage of this IT age and the effect uh, will be felt across every industry. Uh, and it is no accident that uh, Mayor Bloomberg in, the, in uh, New York, uh, when he was the mayor, uh, had this uh, collaboration with Cornell University and, and Technion University to set up the University of Applied Sciences in the, heart, in the heart of New York because they believe that even in fashion, in media, in retail, the, IT set, the advances in IT will drive very critical changes. It's already driving critical changes in finance, but right across a whole a slew of other areas. Now, the hard question is how do you balance it with also having more literature? Uh, I, having more uh, humanities and so on. And those are the reasons why we have to think about it uh, carefully. There's only so many hours that a student has each day. Um, your second question is on, on uh, automation. Whether is it desirable? I, 
I think whether it is desirable or not, uh, there are two things. One is some of the things may not be within our ability to choose. Uh, if factories all over the world are going to be automated, it will be very hard for us to say no to automation. Uh, you might have read that you know, Foxconn, the highest hundreds and thousands of workers in China, is using robots for its production in China when they have so many more workers than, than we have in Singapore. So, uh, America has gone on the trend of using robots for many of its key industries and therefore bringing back advanced manufacturing back to America. So those are global trends that we will not be able to fight. And the question is, how do we best ride this wave of change? It is a major wave and we have to do it well. Uh, I'm Lee Tzu Yang from Shell. Uh, Minister, I, I just feel compelled to comment that the dialogue so far uh -huh. has been very much around uh, the differences in skills that will be needed for the future. And whilst these are extremely important from the viewpoint of competitive advantage and so on, I think it's not only skills, it's also attitudes uh, that will, on one hand, um, support competitive advantage, yeah. but it's also the attitudes that would also distinguish whether the subject of differences is uh, divisive or unifying. And, you know, you talk about education, it's not only about skills, it's about the attitudes that we develop, you know, to, to, to paraphrase the, the film or films, you know, what do men and women really, really want? <laughs> yeah, what do Singaporeans really, really want? And I think that's as important an aspect of our looking at the future as the skills that we are trying to develop amongst us. What yeah. do you say to that? Well, uh, Aziyan, uh, uh, thanks for that question, and, and I fully agree with you. And that's the reason why um, in my very first uh, MOE Work Plan Seminar speech, you know, the first thing that, that we launched is the character and citizenship education. You know, and this whole shift towards a more student-centric, values-driven education. And when, when we started discussing it, uh, my colleagues and I at the ministry were... Uh, to be frank, a little concerned as to how Singaporeans might react because they might think that, oh, you know, this is the state trying to impose a certain set of values on Singaporeans or they're trying to make uh, uh, Singaporeans into a particular mold. But far from it, I think there are certain basic values which I believe that will serve uh, Singaporeans as individuals well and serve us as a group well. Uh, because, for instance, the values of resilience and harmony I think are values which will hold us together as, as, as a society. And a lot of that is not just about learning from the books. I think those values are best expressed in action. And I'm very cheered by uh, first the response from parents, uh, as well as the response uh, from our school leaders and the students themselves. I visited many schools since we spoke about this, and the very imaginative ways in which these different schools and students go about uh, realizing these this values and realizing how we can work together. Let me just cite you one very interesting example. I visited a, a school in a neighborhood and the students had to discuss every month a topic uh, about collective action. And one topic that I saw was, should students be allowed to bring handphones into the classroom? And at the end of it, they decided that while you're in the classroom, you should respect the importance of that class hour and you should respect the teachers, you should respect your fellow students in learning. And, but at the same time, there may be situations where you need to use the handphone and you, you should be able to use that during recess after schools and so on. So they then suggested to the school, can you buy, get us a cubby hole where each one of us can put our handphones and leave it at the door of the classroom, and which they did. And when I visited the classroom, because I was a little puzzled, why was there this little nice, cute uh, cubicle outside the class? And there were quite a few handphones in, in all these uh, little slots. So they explained to me that that was what they did. So I, I fully agree with you that uh, those are the things that are most enduring. Whatever may be the technological changes, at the end of it, I think basic human values and, and virtues uh, still 
must shine through. This side of the room, Sino, you want to start? Yes, please go ahead. Minister, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, you may like to know that just before the session, we had a very interesting debate between uh -huh. Professor Kisho Mahubani and Professor Bengwat. Uh, before the debate, there was vote taking. This is about, con about consensus and contest right. and the future of Singapore. Before the debate, majority of those attending this conference agree that we need consensus more than contest. Halfway through the debate, the vote swung to contest. <laughs> but at the end of the debate, it swung back to consensus. Now this, I don't know whether this reflects the true Singapore situation about what kind of society we want. So I'd like your opinion. Where do we take Singapore forward in terms of consensus building and contest? And, uh, and what, how do you see the final steady state we will come to? If I may share my own experience, you know what happened in Aljunet. <laughs> I call it uh, Aljunet Spring. <laughs> also Arab. <laughs> but uh, I mean, as a politician, I shouldn't say this, but as a Singaporean, I felt, so what if I've lost, if Singapore won? <laughs> but uh, what do you say to that? Did Singapore win? And uh, what will it be like? Bro, say five years what down. kind of a nice blend of politics, consensus, contest that Singapore would need to continue to be the success story we are today? Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Anu, for the, for the uh, very important questions. Uh, first, I think in terms of, in the realm of uh, political contest, uh, we are likely to see a, a greater contest in, in any case. And I think to the extent that you have that contest, it is not a, a bad thing in that, you know, it sharpens our, our ability to deliver better policies, to be able to do things better. Now, the question is where uh, would that be headed first in the political realm, right? So if you look at um, the dynamics of uh, systems around the world, uh, it is not a given that the greater the contest, the, the better the results in terms of what you deliver for a better society. Uh, I mean, the best example of where contest has gone to uh, extreme is probably the US. And so you find that what you have in the end is, is gridlock. And I think the US is, has a very vibrant private sector, a very vibrant uh, NGO sector that does great work. And that helps you know, in, in this and help the society to move along. But I would uh, take it a step further and not to think of a better way forward for Singapore as just a matter of political contest and that and, and that's that. I do think that, that there are many ways in which we can make advances uh, for a better society um, that is not just confined to a political realm. Let me share a, a story which left a very deep impression in me uh, many years ago. Uh, I was at Davos. Um, I was accompanying at that time uh, Minister Mentor who was one of the speakers at Davos. And I had one evening where I, you know, I had like two hours to go and slip away to attend one of the sessions. So I attended this session, which was by a group of uh, uh, NGOs talking about livable city. And that was quite advanced for its time. So there was this uh, Egyptian lady who was wonderful. I mean, she described what she did and you know, how she created a wonderful environment in her neighborhood. And she was brimming with ideas. So I sort of asked, you have such wonderful ideas to make for a, a much better you know, urban planning for in, in Cairo. Why aren't you 
working with the governments to do this. Why aren't you creating more transformational changes? You know? And unfortunately, the, 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 the group had no answer. Now, I, at that time, I, I did not know Egypt very well, so I thought maybe there was something that I didn't understand. So a few years later, I went to Egypt for a visit as a tourist to try and understand the place. And I must say that the remarks of this lady about what she could achieve you know, rang in my mind the whole time I was there. And I said, my goodness, what if this lady had been able to work with the government of the day and transform this place. This will be a wonderful place. And she had wonderful ideas. So I do very much hope that, you know, as we hear in the Singapore conversation, as we hear in the, that I think um, being able to advance good ideas, being able to work together, being able to take the country forward should not be a matter of just a contest amongst political parties. I think it should be a collective effort and that it should not necessarily be an antagonistic uh, contest Right? that I think if we are able to harness the creative energies of our people uh, to solve the many challenges, to climb the many mountains that we can create, I think we will do far better as a society. And just a few days ago, when I launched the logo, I launched the Singapore 50 campaign, a number of people came up to me, they attended the launch, and they said, we have this idea for celebrating Singapore 50. We have this idea for honouring our pioneer generation. We have this. And I was so cheered by that. I felt so inspired uh, by that sort of positive energy that we belong to Singapore, we are proud of Singapore, we want to do things, and we want to take the country forward. Okay? And not necessarily because I cannot get through to you as a government, therefore I'm so fed up that I need to go and start uh, you know, a, a different movement. And I don't think... Um, it is a good way for us to use our creative energy. So I'm not saying that political contest has no place. Right? I'm saying that it has. But for us to think about governance very narrowly just in terms of political contest would be to miss a big opportunity for us to have a different model of governance for us to think about how we can take the country forward. Yeah. Any more questions on this slide? Or? Okay. Shall I, can I give... Andy I think first. Professor Andy, yeah. yeah. And then. Anne Wee from NUS. Thank you, Minister. And we have so much to be proud of in our education system. I think especially the ITE, and then if you were a slow starter, it gives you a chance to buck up and you could finish up at university. But I wonder whether you're at all concerned that perhaps our very elite youngsters who are the future leaders could spend a bit more time together if the SAP school system could be modified. When I hear of a university Chinese chap say, I've never had a conversation with an Indian, I feel that's not typical of Singapore. When I hear of a highly a successful Malay girl being told that she will have to move out of this school because it's becoming a sub school. I'm sorry that these elite children are not spending more time together. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. Mm. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Enwi, for your question. By the way, uh, I knew Professor Enwi for many, many years, and she was she taught me a lot when I was a young policeman <laughs> yeah, about. Uh, how to analyze data and about sociology and the social work. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, on, on your question about whether we should have greater mixing, greater social mixing, I fully agree with you. And I think we need to think of how we can do this better. Um, I, I think our uh, future leaders need to be brought up in an environment where they are able to interact from uh, uh, students from all different uh, you know, groups. And that's how I think we can help to build a sense of togetherness. Now, how to do it um, is something that you know, we have been look, looking at to see what are the various ways we can do better. I think we've tried over the years. Uh, for instance, uh, schools that partner another school to a uh, whole range of different activities. And the question is whether we can do more of that or whether we can modify some of it even more. Uh, 
recently, I, we changed the uh, system to allow for students from uh, normal technical stream and normal academic stream to take subjects at a higher level. And I think that will create some uh, even greater mixing in, in, our, in our schools. Uh, I, was, I also let add that for the boys, uh, at least they have the experience of NS. And I think in NS, they do meet uh, people from different groups, which is, which is very good. Um, there has been suggestion that we should have uh, NS for girls. Uh, I'm not sure I, I would like to broach that subject, but this came out in the Singapore conversation. But essentially, I think if we can create, uh, in our community, uh, groups from you know, interacting more freely, uh, I think it's great. I recently had a, a witness a basketball tournament where I had students and, and adults from all sorts of backgrounds coming together, uh, united by one common cause and their love for basketball. And it was a very nice, comfortable, easygoing relationship. And I thought that's, that's wonderful. And we should try and think what more we can do. Yeah. Hi, Minister Hi, Janice Dennis. Koh. I am Minister, I hope you'll forgive me. I just felt compelled to ask this in response to your earlier comment about how we have only so many hours in the day and therefore the study of books and literature and humanities need to be balanced against the competing demands on our children's time. I really don't want to start a contest between the sciences and the arts because I feel both are equally important and in fact, the geniuses of our both times, the news in both the sciences, medicine, as well as the arts. But my question is, going back to your earlier point about norms and changing norms, I think in the past what we had was the luxury of time for the negotiation of these norms and the normalizing of new norms. But in today's age, and we've talked so much about the speed of technological change, we may not have the luxury of time. We don't have the time of trying to moderate our views against those of others when we have instant access to all kinds of information and ideas. Therefore, don't you think then, Minister, that issues, uh, the way in which we then deal with issues with heart and empathy all the more make important the study of the humanities, the human culture, human behavior, philosophy, and the way we express it, that that has become increasingly important and urgent in the education of our children. Well, thanks, uh, Janice, for that question. Uh, I understand that uh, my colleague, uh, Anne, uh, raised this issue early on about the study of literature. So, uh, first, let, let, me, let me state my own position about literature. You know, I, I took literature as a student, and I enjoyed it tremendously. I found it you know, meaningful and, and uh, enjoyable, and has served me very well in my life. My only regret is that today I don't have as much time to read, and uh, so I have plenty of books at home, and I say I'll read it when I retire. <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and I do think that we ought uh, to promote uh, literature, we ought to promote seri serious fiction uh, more. And on that, I'm uh, uh, totally with you. Now, there are, but I've seen in our schools um, <clears throat> a number of uh, changes that are happening which, which I think are very encouraging. First, um, we have teachers who have very creatively uh, infused literature lessons into the English language lessons and use that as a starting point to discuss and to interest students to go and read on their own. So it's not just about, okay, tomorrow let's impose a requirement that every student will now have to do literature. I think we do well by encouraging that uh, interest. And I see some of our teachers beginning to do that. And as we do more of it, this will grow. Um, second, I see even history teachers uh, doing very interesting work in that area. So for instance, instead of just you know, reading and looking at the, it, when we study history when I was in school, it was to memorize a bunch of facts. In, a, in recent years, we have uh, teachers who say, our MOE system has changed, so it's based on source-based question, you look at the sources and you try and evaluate the accuracy and the reliability of the, of the sources. Now I see some of our teachers going a step further on perspective taking. I witnessed a class where 
um, students were reenacting World War II and had to take the position of different parties uh, to the war and to say, what is your perspective and what does that mean to you? How would you feel? Uh, they took the position of the soldiers, they took the position of the victims. And I think it is a very rich way of sharing perspective. Okay. Um, then finally, I would say that when we, I understand fully your concern about first the love for the language, and I wish that you know we could. Uh, I mean, I, I wish that I had a lot more exposure when I was younger, but I will fully endorse that. And when we encourage our students to read more, it, it's something which I very much hope that we can do a lot more. Um, that's one. But two, the value of literature is also to help us better appreciate the human conditions and to understand people, understand the human conditions, understand uh, perspectives. And that's where I think we should not see um, the humanities in isolation and with what else we do. I visited a number of schools where we, they do these values in action. They go to the people who, who need help, they talk to them, uh, they learn from, say, the elderly in our old folks' home. Uh, they learn from the elderly in our community. They learn from various groups of people. And that's as much a way of developing empathy as it is in just uh, reading literature. So I would say that, again, that there isn't one and only one approach. Uh, I would say that if we are able to understand the basic goals of education and what we seek to do, then if we, the more we are able to infuse it across the different things that we do, uh, the more we can develop that sense of empathy, uh, that appreciation of others, and uh, also to address uh, Ziyang's point about, you know, it's not just about technical skills, but really about what it means to be human. And uh, we should do it across the different realms and to keep emphasizing how we can do this better. Yeah. If I may make it. A small comment on literature. I, I, I'm all in favor of literature. I did literature my, in university and um, I wrote a language column for many years in the Straits Times. But I have a certain doubt about uh, the rhetoric that surrounds itself along lit on literature. It was very embarrassing for people in the humanities, but after the war, uh, Second World War, when the concentration camps in Europe were liberated by Allied forces. We discover that the commandants of camps, Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, and so on, were not uncultured men, but very cultured men. They listened to Goethe, they listened, I mean, they, they read Goethe, they listened to Beethoven um, in the evenings, and the next morning they, they gassed people with um, <laughs> impunity. Um, I, I don't think it is the solution any more than then religion itself, by itself, makes um, us all humane and, and uh, saints. I mean, that's, we know that's not, not the case. Um, uh, I certainly hope that uh, many more than 9% of our student cohort would <laughs> uh, read literature, um, but uh, I, I don't think it is uh, the solution to all our problems. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Chin Bin, uh, Minister. My question is related to the 50 years uh, celebration of Singapore coming next year. Thank you for your commercial quiz just now. <laughs> uh, I remember this about two weeks ago, lastly in line with the theme, uh, our Mr. Kiko published an uh, article in Swiss Time, which uh, the title is uh, The Year of the Big Ideas. In, in all of the article, is, uh, one of the key points Mr. Kiko reads, I fully agree is well, we, said we can proudly, definitely celebrate our outstanding, amazing achievement over the past almost 50 years from now. However, the country cannot live on the intellectual capital of the past forever. So at the end of the article, Mr. Kishore urged the readers, whoever has the outlandish idea, to write an email to him. So I read, I read an email to Mr. Kishore, but I will not repeat the, what idea I propose. I'm very glad to have such a valuable opportunity to have the dialogue with you, so I would like to pose this question to you. For Singapore as a country, so 
So what would be your most vehicle, most authentic or radical idea to upgrade Singapore to another grade level for the next, let's say, 50 years? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, Ying Ming, is it? Huh? Xin Min. Uh, well, Xin Min, th thanks for your questions. Um, uh, first, let, let me say that Singapore 50 is not uh, just a celebration of our past achievements. I think that would uh, that would be a part of it, but it's not the main part of it. Certainly, we're proud of our achievements, but I think Singapore 50, uh, when we look back at the past, is really about the celebration of our people, right? how um, we have come together over the years, uh, the contributions of individuals, of groups, to really make Singapore what it is today. And hopefully to draw lessons from what is it that allowed us to do it uh, together? You know, and what are, how do we, uh, going back to my question about this diversity and unity and this uh, perpetual balancing that one needs to make, what is it that we have done that allow us to achieve some of this well? So that's uh, one point about Singapore 50 celebration. Now then on your question of, you know, what is the one big idea that, uh, that could take us forward I, I'm very wary about the one big idea because uh, as you will note from my remarks earlier on about the early childhood education, I think it's very important. I think we should do a lot more. But to say that that is a silver bullet to education, uh, I empirically think it's hard to justify that. So I'm not sure that there is one big idea that, that would take us forward. Uh, but if there's one thing that I hope to see uh, in this effort, it is that Singaporeans feel inspired by each other, feel inspired by what we can achieve, what we can do together, and not just in the economic sense, but what kind of a better society we can build together. And if we are able to do that, then you will have a flowering of different ideas, different ways of how we might commit uh, to doing it. And I understand that earlier on, you all had a poll of you know, whether it's the government doing more or whether it's the community doing more. And many of you feel that the community should do more. So I will encourage you to, the community to come forward and celebrate Singapore 50. Not just about the past, not just about the people who have made the contribution, but really to celebrate our future, to celebrate what we can provide for our next generation so that in 50 years' time, uh, the, someone can still come along and say, let's celebrate Singapore 100. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed the lady. That's uh, right. Hi, Minister. Good hi. afternoon. I'm Bernadette. I'm from Singapore Compact or CSR. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, one of the three things that you mentioned just now was about managing differences um, and enlarging the common space so yeah. that we focus on finding common causes that we can work towards. Right. Um, I would just like to ask for your thoughts um, about the areas where, you know, it's the most difficult stuff that people can't see eye to eye on. But that's also that area that if there's lack of knowledge, it always breeds fear. Mm -hmm. So how do you, in your opinion, how would you see us continuing a dialogue? I mean, we may not come to agreement on something, but at least continuing that dialogue so that more people can, you know, have a, an awareness of areas or things that they may not be very comfortable with um, or subjects that they may not be familiar with. Mm. And uh, related to that um, is this whole idea of the civil society playing a larger role. I think in Singapore, our civil society is still at a very nascent stage of voicing their thoughts and their, their opinions on things. And uh, so you end up having more people going on internet to express their thoughts and concerns over, you know, in the view of anonymity, uh -huh. and that can be quite vile. Um, so how do we, do you think our civil society is ready to have a dialogue where you can agree to disagree? Um, and how do we raise that level of maturity um, so that people can sit in a room like this, have a conversation, without tearing each other's hairs out or taking right. their easily cards oh. out to spit on it or whatever, you know. <laughs> Find a better way to express ourselves yes. in a more civilised manner. Thank you. Yes. 
Well, thank you, Bernadette, for, for those questions. So you have three questions. The first is, you know, what do we do with subjects for which we have very, uh, we may not have the full knowledge of, and what can we do about it? And I think it, it is really, it depends on the context, depends on what is the subject matter. And uh, in many areas, uh, our knowledge about particular issues and uh, the data that we have about those issues, I think are a lot more than it was before. So it really depends on what is the subject at hand, and I think we can continue to talk about you know, what are those areas that we would like to have a deeper understanding of. Um, your second question about civil society uh, playing a larger role. Uh, indeed, I have, uh, in the course of my work in MOE, met many groups who are doing a very good work, and I would like to see, you know, to encourage them to, to do more. So for instance, uh, uh, Anne and I have been working with uh, our schools for special needs children. And when I first visited some of those schools as the minister, I was really very struck by the passion of the educators and the passion of the people who were supporting these educators. And I, I thought, you know, that it was wonderful. And also, it was not just... Um, civil society being you know, left on to, to fend for themselves, uh, they requested, for instance, over the years that perhaps a school principal who understands pedagogy uh, be seconded to look at the pedagogical aspect. And some of our principals who put up their hand to volunteer for those schools, again, have such a heart for, for these children that they, they're doing a very good job. And in turn, they work very closely with the... Uh, the, the NGO groups, the BWO groups, to really take this forward. And I'm very happy to see how they are looking at, for instance, what we can do at the workplace. So I think those are uh, good areas that we can continue to work on. I do hope that, you know, that to be able to find uh, these common causes for us to work together, uh, if different groups can agree on what uh, our underlying goals and objectives. Uh, we can debate about what is a better method, you know, what is a better way of teaching uh, children with dyslexia, what is a better way. But I think our underlying concern must be the same, that we do want to help these children do better. And you know, when that is the case, I don't think you, there needs to be, uh, 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 it needs to be unproductive. Uh, at the same time, I do hope that the Civil societies in Singapore do not just become a narrow advocacy group. Uh, I've seen some of this uh, in places, both in Singapore and elsewhere, where if we take a very narrow view that my cause is the most important cause in the world, uh, and that it's either my cause or no cause, you know, then I think it will make for a poorer society. Uh, what you end up with is a lot of uh, contests, a lot of unproductive energy, because it then becomes, um, you know, too narrowly uh, cost-based without looking at what is a broader position that that would advance the, the broader uh, interest. So I, I would say that um, thinking about how this relationship can evolve is, is important. Uh, the, your last question is a very important one about anonymity of the internet. And I would say that not all uh, civil society groups uh, are anonymous and that they'll go on the internet. I think you're referring to another phenomenon where groups of people uh, under the cloak of anonymity can make very disparaging remarks. Uh, again, it is for us as a society, as individuals, to take a stand on some of these issues. I don't think that it advances, it makes us more enlightened decision makers or makes us a better person with some of the venom that you uh, read online because it's not a reasoned argument. Uh, and sometimes it is disparaging uh, of people who are trying to do good work. And I think we should be prepared to take a stand that we as a society should not uh, have that sort of behavior. I mentioned some time back that I once uh, uh, deleted a post on my Facebook who said, please sack this particular principal. 
And just a one-liner like that. And I felt very disturbed by that. That whatever may be the case, I don't think one has a right to assassinate someone that way. You know, there's due process and one should not have the freedom to say, go, go kill this person or go sack this person. You know, I think we need to have more uh, enlightened and reasoned discourse if we want to really progress as a society. Minister, yeah. my name is Yang Razali Kasim from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. I have two questions. The first is on the idea of meritocracy. Uh, of late, we've heard the Prime Minister mention the concept of open and compassionate meritocracy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you have been mentioned or at least perceived as a potential leading light of the next generation of leaders. If you were the Prime Minister, how would you implement this idea of open and compassionate meritocracy? My Language. second question is on this morning, uh, Professor Kwok Kien Woon uh, referred to one uh, illustration of uh, a setting whereby a group of, I suppose, Chinese uh, students uh, learning a language. And he mentioned that, if I'm not wrong, they were learning the national language that was a setting in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, or the 50s. Now, it is, I find that fascinating because it is a setting that many of us seem to have forgotten that there is such a thing as a national language in Singapore and that that national language was Malay. Now, going forward, as we talk about nation building, how do you see uh, the role of natural language to be in terms of forging consensus and forging a future Singapore? Mm -hmm. Again, if I can phrase it, frame it, if you were given a chance to lead the government, how would you implement that idea of a national language? Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, Yang Razali. I, uh, I was tempted to uh, answer you by saying that it's such a hypothetical question <laughs> that I won't have to answer the rest of your question. <laughs> but uh, so I, 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 I'm not going to accept the premise of your question, which is that, you know, if I were in charge of the government, what I would do. But let me just say it, uh, articulate my personal views about uh, these two issues that you raised. First, the issue of meritocracy and what do we mean by open meritocracy and compassionate uh, meritocracy. Now, um, I, I think it is important that in Singapore, meritocracy does not become a, a dirty word. You know, that is something that we should now abandon because uh, I think to have a system of selection, whether it's, you know, in schools or on the job, on the basis of a person's performance and ability uh, is the right thing to do. I mean, not on the basis of connections, on the basis of your family wealth, on the basis of, you know, any other attributes. And I, I do think that that's something that we should um, maintain. Now, then the question is, how do we ensure that we continue to keep it open? I think many of us in this room who were from the older generation, uh, will find that in our days, when you know, ev everyone was poor, it was a lot easier for, for all of us to uh, uh, do well 
for us to do well in, in schools and then to you know, make advances. But as the society becomes, uh, you know, over time, where it becomes more settled, and it's got nothing to do with meritocracy as such, it is just that in a more mature society, you'll find that parents who are better off would certainly want to give their kids a leg up. Right? It happens in every society. I think the most interesting examples I can think of is if you read the New York Times and all this uh, anxiety of parents put, put their kids into the best kindergarten you know, and, and taking all kinds of psychological tests to prove that the kid is gifted. Uh, you, you see that at work all over the world. Right? And, and I think it is a natural phenomenon, even in China. Um, I was once in China and I saw this very cute, uh, you know, this, this official was telling me that the, the best advertisement that we have seen in China is this thing that you are not a genius, but your child can be a genius. <laughs> so come to my school <laughs> and we'll make your child a genius. And they charge an arm and a leg for that. Right? And many parents were happily paying for that. And what I think we need to do is that in Singapore, our school system is almost entirely state-funded. Every school, except for three small uh, uh, international schools, every Singaporean child goes to a state-funded school. And we invest a lot of resources in making sure that every child gets the opportunity to learn and to learn well. And when you look at... Um, um, the changes that, that are happening, uh, for instance, on the P1 registration, we, I, we recently moved to making sure that some of these places remain open. So it's not just that, of course, my grandfather was in that school, therefore I will be in that school. And it's to prevent this entrenchment of a particular groups of people, to keep the system open. And this is a constant challenge because uh, very soon, the, the, the kids who get into that school will have a sibling and therefore you need to have that. And then you have to think about what to do maybe the next education minister can start to think about what he may need to do. But it is to keep our system open. And when we talk about compassionate meritocracy, it is a recognition that the globalization process means that we should try our very best to help everyone ride this wave of globalization and, and ride this very difficult changes. But at the same time, there will be others who may be left behind who find it difficult to cope. And that's where I think for us to be able to provide assistance in a meaningful way to, to these different groups, to make sure that no group feels that they've been left behind, and, and to make sure that as a society we progress together, but yet keeping to the tenet that you should really let the person who can best do the job, do the job, right? rather than to fix it by any other criteria. And if we take this consistent position of how do we help individuals to succeed, then it means putting in more effort in particular areas uh, to see that you know, those with the kids who need extra help are given extra help. The kids who have the potential to go further are given the help to go further. And in that way, the whole society can be uh, carried along, can, can continue to progress. Now, on the question on the uh, national language, I think that our national language do have a special place uh, in, in Singapore society. Uh, we still sing the national anthem uh, in, in, uh, in Bahasa. We, uh, the drills in our you know, in the uniform groups are all in our national language. And I think in many of our schools, um, for instance, quite a number of our students now take uh, conversational Malay in, uh, in the schools. And what we need to do is to provide more opportunities for people to learn rather than for us to... Uh, to, to, I mean, to really basically provide the opportunities to do so. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we have come to the end of our time. Um, if I might ask the last question, perhaps to focus your summation, uh, something that came up from the debate between uh, Kishore and Bengwa just now, and something also that, uh, uh, um, that was picked up by Zainu in his question. Um, both Kishore and Benghuat actually agreed on one fundamental thing, that we cannot 
or we are not likely to be able to rule ourselves in the way we did over the past 40 years. There can't be a top-down system of governance. Uh, there will be a variety of opinions. Singapore will, in fact, become more plural, is, in fact, more plural and more diverse, uh, both sociologically as well as culturally as, and, and politically. Um, and, and we will have to find some way of managing mm -hmm. uh, these differences. Um, the question I have is, Singapore has survived over the past 50 years and will probably have to continue surviving in this region only if it remains an exceptional country. Can it remain an exceptional country if we are unable to establish a certain consensus, not only on the fundamentals, but on the main policy planks yeah. um, uh, uh, that, that we need to settle? Well, thanks, Janadas, for that question. I, th I think um, what is uh, striking about our conversation this afternoon is that uh, one or two of you mentioned the external dimension uh, and, and the global dimension of, uh, of Singapore. And I think we really need to see Singapore within that, that, global con that regional context and that global context. Developments in our neighbouring countries, developments within Asia, developments around the world, are going to affect us in very deep and fundamental ways. How and you know, whether we can, will continue to thrive depends critically on being able to agree on some of these fundamentals. Where do we see ourselves as a society going forward? What are some of the principles of governance that we should um, maintain? What are some new principles that we need to think of that will allow us to come together and how do we harness this uh, diversity, you know, these diverse views and these creative energies of different groups of people uh, into a common cause that we can all be proud of uh, to take us forward? And so I very much hope that as we think about celebrating Singapore uh, 50, we think not just about celebrating about past, but really about crafting our future. And I think crafting our future depends very much on us being able to come together, uh, both as Singaporeans, as well as Singaporeans interacting with the world, uh, with the many the different people in Singapore, you know, our expatriates, as well as a broader global community, to be able to think, to be able to set ourselves the sort of, or to be able to agree on the aspirations that we should pursue, to be able to agree on the modalities of pursuing that, and that's a modality that would evolve over time, and to be able to have the trust uh, among ourselves to say that, yes, this is how, whatever may be our differences in views, this is how we can continue to progress, find common causes, work together, respect each other's differences, and as uh, Bernadette uh, mentioned, you know, to have a respectful uh, conversation that will be enlightening. And I think this evolutionary process uh, would be organic. I th but I think if each of us is willing to do our part, I think we'll make for a, a very vibrant, creative, energetic society that can continue to solve many of these difficult challenges ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. We've come to the end of another Singapore Perspectives. Uh, we started at 8.30 and we're finishing at 5.15 or a little past 5.15. Um, I must uh, thank firstly the, the three chief organizers of the conference, Wai Fong, uh, Christopher and Matthew, for doing all the legwork with conceptualizing the conference, preparing the material, and in Matthew's case, conducting a massive survey on Singaporeans' attitudes on race, language, and religion. We're not done with releasing the results of that survey. We just got one cut. Um, there are more uh, things that are, that, that are to be released, and we will be organizing a, a conference dedicated to that survey later in the year. Um, I want, also want to thank uh, Irene and uh, IPS staff for all the organization uh, they did in uh, setting up these tables. You may have noticed, I don't, want, I don't think anyone has noticed, but the theme of the conference being different, um, each, the, the tables are differently colored. So, I mean, it, the, <laughs> 
this was um, uh, has symbolic significance if you haven't noticed. Um, um, I must uh, also mention, with Minister's indulgence, um, every year this arrangement um, where uh, we have something special in IPS. Every year when the Singapore Perspectives or any major event like this uh, occurs, members of staff of IPS who may have left IPS 10 years ago, 15 years ago, return voluntarily to help us organize this. And this is... <laughs> This is very unusual. Um, I don't know of this happening in any other organization. And I must say that is one reason above all why this happens in IPS every year without fail, and that is Tommy Cole. Um, Tommy Cole uh, was for the longest time director of IPS and then later chairman of the board um, um, uh, that governed IPS. And then now he still remains our special advisor and the esprit de corps that you see in IPS is almost wholly uh, the result of Tommy. So I'm just the beneficiary, as are almost everybody else in IPS. Uh, next year, um, we have been specializing in this one-word conferences. Um, we've had inequality two years ago. Last year was governance. This year is differences. Next year is very simple. With your permission, it'll be a number, a single number, 50. So. <laughs> So till 50, see you. Thank you very much for attending uh, this conference. Thank you.